This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 140. Coming up on Space Time, NASA launches its new X-ray eyes in the sky. The next man-moon mission could be delayed until 2027. And two more flights across the surface of the Red Planet for NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA has launched the new X-ray telescope to study the most extreme and mysterious objects in the universe, such as supernovae and black holes. The Imaging X-ray Plurimeter Explorer, or XP telescope, was launched aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Falcon is in startup. Okay, and here we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, ignition. And liftoff, liftoff of Falcon 9 and Ixby, a new set of X-ray eyes to view the mysteries of our skies. We hear that the launch vehicle is cleared off, and we're hearing nominal chamber pressures on all nine Merlin engines. It's pitching down range. Power and telemetry nominal. So we're seeing that everything is performing normal so far on the Falcon 9, Daryl. It's a beautiful liftoff this morning. As you and I get to now experience that rumble from the Falcon 9 here at the Mission Director Center of Hangar AD. Uh, things continue to perform well. And uh, we are now stopping. We hear that the vehicle is supersonic, and our next uh, milestone we're looking in to get through max Q, our maximum dynamic pressure. Falcon 9 engines back pulling back just a little bit as that max Q milestone passes. Vehicles made it through max Q and that's great uh, to hear. That's the point of maximum stress on the vehicle, Daryl, and the Falcon 9 uh, is performing well. XP continues downrange uh, successfully and nominally so far. Now, stage one trajectory is looking good. They're starting to chill now. The second stage engine, get it ready to ignite. Everything flying on track and in just about 20 seconds, those engines will cut off. And rapid succession, we'll get Miko. First stage engine cutoff. Stage separation confirmed. And there we have main engine cutoff as MVAC stage ignition. two MVAC D engine gets ready for ignition. And we see that we have ignition on the MVAC D. It's a great sign to see that engine glowing red hot as the first of two burns takes place. The rocket falling back to Earth, the first stage of the rocket as it deploys its grid fins and prepares for its landing. When we have that entry burn, as the rocket booster falls back through Earth's atmosphere, and they slow it down a little bit. We should hear fairing jettison here shortly, which... Fairing we'll, separation confirmed. There we have fairing separation confirmed, and we and that uh, now exposes XP to the environments of space. Uh, it was protected by that fairing uh, on ascent for aero heating and loading, and things are going well. Flight looks nominal so far. MVAC-D is performing very well. Chamber pressures look good and uh, continues on its course. Four minutes into flight, everything looking nominal. 190,000 pounds of thrust from that engine right there. I call that the MVAC engine. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. I can say, Daryl, as we look at this uh, and we continue to watch the data and things perform nominally, uh, I'm just feeling really excited about how second stage is performing. I mean, we had an on-time liftoff this morning at 1 a.m. with the stage one, and stage one continues to fall back to Earth. We should be seeing that entry burn uh, in, you know, about uh, two two minutes uh, to start the recovery of the first stage. Things continue to look good on this mission. Trajectory. There's the call out that everything is looking, as you said, great with stage two. This, the 130th launch of a Falcon 9 rocket carrying the XB spacecraft. First launch also from Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. Yeah, for launch services program, as we stated earlier, it's the first uh, dedicated scientific mission for us. We, we are so excited to be launching from that historic pad uh, uh, with a Falcon 9 where astronauts uh, have launched from uh, during Apollo and shuttle. And uh, now we get to launch one of Launch Services Program's science missions. Stage 1 FTS from, is safe. From there, and uh, everything looks great. Uh, we heard that Stage 1 FTS is safe. That's a, a good uh, sign. Stage 1 entry burn startup. 
the uh, three engines that have uh, started up to slow that first stage down as it re-enters the atmosphere, along with the grid fins as it continues to uh, keep the booster on track and steer. And as that booster falls, this engine burn, roughly 30 seconds long, just basically slowing it down as it goes stage to the atmosphere. Stage one entry burn shut down. And the stage one entry burn there is now, now finished. Looking now to stage two, this one will cut off in about 60 seconds. That will complete... Stage two on nominal trajectory. And that will complete the first burn. We hear from stage the team... Stage two FTS is safe. We hear from the team continuing to look at the data, Daryl. Stage one transonic is uh, still nominal and looking good. Stage two is performing very well, and chamber pressures remain uh, in within family and nominal for this flight. And just seconds away now from the cutoff of that second stage engine, burning brightly, carrying XB through space into its correct orbit. Stage one landing burn. And back engine cutoff. The stage one landing burn has started to get the first stage landing on just read the instructions. And we also heard the call that uh, SECO one has happened. Second now, stage, stage engine one, cutoff. Landing legs have deployed. First stage coming down on the drone ship there. Just read the stage instruction. Looks like the rocket made a great touchdown. Absolutely. Okay, we just heard from the team that are confirming that stage one is down safely. Uh, and uh, that's exciting to be able to bring that booster back for a fifth time. Uh, we'll look forward to see where that booster 1061 shows up for its next mission. It did well today on the uh, first stage burn, getting second stage on its way. Second stage uh, picked up, uh, as we said, nominal trajectory and continued to uh, burn. We are now in a coast phase, Daryl, that you had mentioned earlier, as we uh, head towards that uh, western coast of Africa to get ready for second stage engine burn number two. The XP Observatory is a joint mission between NASA and the Italian Space Agency dedicated to measuring the polarization of X-rays from high-energy deep space objects. The telescope successfully separated from its launch vehicle 33 minutes into the flight, 600 kilometres above the Earth's equator and mission managers received their first spacecraft telemetry about seven minutes later. XB carries three state-of-the-art space telescopes with special polarization-sensitive detectors. Polarization is a property of light that holds clues about the environment from which the light originates. The new mission builds on and complements the scientific discoveries of other telescopes, including the Chandra X-ray Observatory, NASA's flagship X-ray space telescope. First light operations with XP are slated to begin next month. This report from NASA TV. To answer some of the biggest questions about what's out there in the universe and what it all means, we need powerful telescopes. NASA unravels the mysteries of the cosmos using observatories in space that study the different wavelengths and properties of light. The Imaging X-ray Polarimetry Explorer, or XP, We'll study X-rays from some of the most extreme objects in the universe, like black holes, in a new way. XP will look at a special property of X-rays that has gone mostly unexplored until now. It's called polarization. X-rays come from the hottest places in the universe. Imagine powerful explosions, violent collisions, and strong magnetic fields creating chaos in the darkness of deep space. X-ray telescopes can trace clouds of gas heated to millions of degrees and detect the shower of particles fueled by a feeding black hole. Building on the discoveries of NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory and other space telescopes, XB measures the orientation of X-rays from some of the most brilliant and bizarre objects in space. Like all forms of light, X-rays consist of moving electric and magnetic waves. Usually, the peaks and valleys of these waves move in random directions. Polarized light is more organized with the two types of waves vibrating in the same direction. You might have heard of polarized sunglasses. Boaters and fishermen use these lenses to reduce glare from sunlight across a body of water. Water reflects light in a way that causes some of it to vibrate in a direction parallel to the water's surface. Polarized lenses block light moving horizontally, but let other light through. Much like the way light changes when it bounces off of water, in space, light becomes polarized depending on where it comes from and what it passes through. By measuring the amount and direction of polarization, 
Ixby gives us clues about the shapes, structures, and inner workings of all types of objects that shine in bright X-rays. The Ixby Observatory has three identical telescopes with three main parts, mirrors, detectors, and an extendable mast or boom that separates them. Each mirror assembly contains 24 nested mirrors that collect and focus X-rays. Located at the focal point of the mirrors, sensitive detectors made with international partners in Italy are the secret behind Ixby's unique X-ray vision. They track and measure all four properties of incoming light, its arrival time, direction, energy, and most importantly, polarization. Over the two years of its prime mission, Ixby will observe more than 50 brilliant objects, like the leftovers of huge stars that exploded into supernovae, the supermassive black hole at the heart of our own Milky Way galaxy, and pulsars, the dense remains of stars that once were. These observations will help scientists tackle long-standing puzzles, like testing competing theories about pulsars and the details of how Einstein's theory of general relativity works. New insights from XP will help us paint a fuller picture of the universe, confirming or confounding our thinking in the years to come. This is space time. Still to come, a manned moon landing could be delayed until 2027, and the Mars Ingenuity helicopter undertakes two more flights across the red planet. All that and more still to come on space time. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. NASA's original plans to return people to the moon in 2024 have already been pushed back by a year thanks to budget shortfalls and problems with new lunar spacesuits. Now there are serious concerns that man won't return to the moon until 2027 at the earliest, meaning it's going to take longer to get back to the moon than what it did to get there in the first place. From the time of President John F. Kennedy's famous speech to the U.S. Congress in May 1961, it took just eight years for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin in Apollo 11 to land on the moon's Sea of Tranquility in July 1969. The current Artemis program to return humans to the lunar surface began in December 2017. Now, a new audit from NASA's Office of the Inspector General claims that even the revised 2025 goal is unrealistic. The audit blames space agency management and significantly less congressional funding than NASA sought for the delays. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic also played its part. This is space time. Still to come. Two more flights across the red planet for NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter. And later in the science report, a new study warns that Australian native plants and wildlife are facing extinction on a massive scale. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter has completed another two flights in the skies over the Red Planet. The latest journeys bring Ingenuity's tally to 17 missions since first landing in Jezero Crater, attached to the underbelly of NASA's Mars Perseverance rover back in mid-February. NASA originally planned just five flights over 30 days on Mars, but the tissue box-sized aircraft continues to thrive. Ingenuity is supporting the car-sized six-wheeled Perseverance rover, scouting ahead as it explores Jezero Crater, drilling rock samples in the hunt for signs of ancient microbial life on Mars. 
Flight 16 saw the 1.8 kilogram rotocopter climb to an altitude of 10 meters. It then flew 116 meters northeast over a formation known as the Raised Ridges before landing in the edge of the South Ceta geologic unit. The 109 second journey allowed mission managers to capture images oriented to the southwest, and it set ingenuity up for the Ceta crossing on Flight 17. However, Flight 17 didn't go quite according to plan, with the radio communications link between Ingenuity and Perseverance being disrupted during the final descent phase of the mission. About 15 minutes later, Perseverance received several packets of additional Ingenuity telemetry of the 117-second flight, indicating that the flight electronics and battery were healthy. It seems the 187-metre flight was a success. Mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, say the loss of signal disruption was likely caused by the terrain, with the landing site being on the other side of a small ridge. Of course, it could also have been caused by an obstruction on part of the rover's structure, especially if the helicopter happened to be on the rover's port or stern side, where Perseverance's multi-mission radioisotope thermoelectric generator is located. Still, the telemetry shows that Ingenuity is charging its batteries as expected, and that suggests that its solar array is pointing towards the Martian sky, meaning the helicopter landed upright. This is Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study suggests that COVID-19 may have become more lethal in the UK in late 2020. The findings, reported in the journal PLOS One, are based on statistical analyses of the lethality of the virus using weekly data on case numbers and coronavirus deaths. The analysis suggests that the increase in the lethality of the COVID-19 virus began before the Alpha variant became the dominant strain in the UK, which the researchers cross-checked with Germany and France, finding similar patterns. The work also suggests that other factors, including seasonality and pressure on health services, could also have contributed to the lethality of the disease, rather than just the effect of new variants. Over five and a quarter million people have now been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus since it first spread out of Wuhan, China, in late 2019. However, the World Health Organization says the true death toll is likely to be double that amount, with more than a quarter of a billion confirmed cases. A new report warns that Australian native plants and animals are facing extinction on a massive scale because of the introduction of invasive species. Australia already has the world's highest rate of vertebrate mammal extinctions and invasive species have contributed to the extinction of at least 79 Australian species. And over 8 in 10 nationally listed threatened species are now endangered by invasive species. The report by the CSIRO pegs the conservative cost of damage caused by invasive species in Australia, predominantly weeds and feral animals, at some $390 billion over the past six decades, with a further $25 billion each year and growing. Globally, invasive species are ranked as the fifth greatest issue facing the environment. But in Australia, it remains the number one issue. The report urges Australian governments to increase their focus on breakthrough solutions to combat major feral species within the next 30 years. Archaeologists have discovered what may well be the oldest piece of decorated jewellery ever found on the Eurasian continent, and with it the emergence of symbolic behaviour in human evolution. The ornate 41,500-year-old oval-shaped ivory pendant was made from carved mammoth bone and dates back to the early Upper Paleolithic period. The research, published in the journal Scientific Reports, indicates that the pendant was discovered in Poland in 2010, together with a horsebone tool known as an awl. The decoration includes patterns of over 50 puncture marks in an irregular looping curve and two complete holes. The authors suggest that the pattern of indentations, similar to later jewellery found in Europe, could represent hunting tallies using a mathematical counting system, or possibly lunar notations that correspond to the monthly cycle of the moon or sun. Well, it seems Australia isn't very scary, according to a new list of the world's most haunted places. 
Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says the survey by a bunch of ghost hunters even includes a haunted house in New Zealand, together with the usual collection of graveyards, castles and deep dark forests. Yeah, no, this is it's really disappointing. I feel left out here. I mean, it, it's a list of most haunted places and different places from, from different uh, countries, etc. And all around the world, even New Zealand gets one, but uh, Australia doesn't get any. I mean, apparently we're not very scary when they have any haunted places, which is disappointing. I mean, yeah, the list is sort of uh, it's pretty broad brush if you want to sort of look at the most haunted places in the world, not the most haunted places in my neighbourhood or something. But uh, some of these are your uh, perennial, like the Stanley Hotel in America, which is inspired Stephen King to write The Shining, which is not the hotel in the Kubrick film, The Shining, but it is in the remake that Stanley King made based on The Shining. So it's got a bit of a checkered history, but that's supposed to have all sorts of uh, ghoulies. Things. Another one is the really weird, the um, Aokigahara, I hope I pronounced that correct, Aokigahara Forest in Japan, which is also known as the suicide forest, where people go to commit suicide. And it's um, it's a bit of a, you know, people are very mixed about the purposes and whether this place should even exist. But people do, do go there, and of course, naturally, with all these suicides, there are um, spirits hanging around. Other places, Tower of London, that's pretty straightforward. There's the Castle of Good Hope, which doesn't sound, you know, very encouraging. In South Africa, there's the Forbidden City in um, Beijing, and there's Alcatraz, the island in uh, San Francisco. And the one in uh, New Zealand, Zealand is called Lanark Castle, which I don't know. They have um, castles in New Zealand. That's amazing. There's not many castles. I think there's more a stately home, right? And it's not someone obviously built a stately home. That um, and it's uh, built by a fellow named William Lanark and his family. His ballroom is supposed to be haunted by his favourite daughter. So yeah, she died of typhoid, etc. So yeah, that's the one in New Zealand, which I don't know, which I perhaps needs a good bit of publicity. Perhaps the Edinburgh Zealand Castle tourist. didn't make the list. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps the yeah the New Zealand tourist um, board or wherever they are should actually get onto that and promote that more. But I'm sure there's some scary places in, in Australia. I mean, where I live is scary. Yeah. You've got that road, really. haven't you? Uh, yeah, there, there's the road. Yeah, which is um, in Sydney, which is a road through the bush between suburbs where you're supposed to be figures keep appearing. Uh, the Waco's Parkway we're talking about, folks. Yeah, the Waco's Parkway in Sydney. And uh, that's supposed to be haunted and people suddenly appear in your back seat and then disappear when you're driving through it or appear by the side of the road or whatever. Which can be most uncomfortable appearing in your back seat. I think it would be, actually, someone just suddenly appearing in your back seat sitting there saying, yeah, just let me off here, thanks. But uh, no, no, that one doesn't wait a mention. I thought, you know, nothing in Australia wait a mention. Apparently we're a very boring bunch. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from spacetimewithstuartgary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 